Jesus called his followers to care for the foreigner and refugee living among us. Adventists all over the world are doing just that. Anise is a Seventh-day Adventist living just outside Washington, D.C. He grew up in the country of Jordan and spends time each year in medical mission there. Since living in the United States, he decided that a single trip each year was simply not enough. He took action to seek out refugee communities in his area to help meet their needs. We used to go out and deliver food supplies to a refugee center in Gettysburg, Maryland. But we never got a chance to meet those families. Anise realized that in order to have a larger impact, he needed to get to know these families face to face. The uh, personal interaction is very important because here, as refugees from a foreign country, they have no relatives or families, you know. So this has become a personal touch with them and to build the relationships and build the bridges, they have become our friends. And one of the Syrian refugee children was telling her mother, Mom, I like it when the church come and visit us. Anise and others have combined community, relationship, and service in a Christ-like way. They visit the many apartment homes of the refugee families and bring them items that the families may need. This has been a great way to show these families that the Adventist community truly cares about them. This has become part of my ministry. With, uh, we gather food supplies and cleaning supplies as needed, and we deliver to our friends who have come from a foreign land. We bring, you know, rice, olive oil, cooking oil, lentils, uh, laundry detergent, and other cleaning supplies. This work has helped many refugee families feel more comfortable. But just like Jesus' ministry here on Earth, Anissa's mission is to build genuine connections. The primary focus of our relationship is to be their friends. And also, during the pandemic, we have kept that personal touch. Even if we haven't come to see them, I constantly on the phone talking to them every week just to see how they are, be of encouragement to them. And that has meant a lot to me personally. Anis and many others are continuing to embrace the calling of Jesus to love and care for their neighbors who are foreigners and refugees. Please pray for Anis and his friends to continue finding ways to serve these vulnerable communities and find even more ways to show Jesus' love. On the stage, I brought my own little box that I want you to see. Now, for everyone else, you see that camera sitting there focused on it? You're going to get to see it on the screen, too. But are there any boys and girls that want to come up closer and see what's going on? Everyone's being shy today. Do you want to come up and see what's going on? There, we got a volunteer coming up. And I'll put on my mask while you're here. Come right over here and you'll get to see, and you can have a seat right there. I'm going to move this out of the way. Can I convince any other boys and girls to come forward? All right. Well, I'm going to talk to everyone, but right now it's me and Joshua. Hey, we got somebody else that's going to come up. All right. Here you go. All right. I think I met you before. What is your name? Jordan. Hi, Jordan and Joshua. When I was a little boy, there was something I liked to do a lot. I would play in my sandbox. Do either of you like to play in the sandbox? Hmm. My dad made me a sandbox. It was about as big as all of this area right here. And every year he would come and he would put new sand in there. Because somehow when I played, the sand would get out. And so in the spring, he would put new sand in there. And I liked to play in there with my cars and my trucks and my plastic horses and all the things I had. I would make houses and castles and I had fun there. And you know, no. people... 
Hey, I like you're listening good. <laughs> People do a lot of things with sand. All kind of things with sand. In fact, Jesus talked about sand. Did you do you know the song? The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. Do you know that song? Yeah. Can you sing it with me? Everybody. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. And the rains came tumbling down. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. And the house on the rock stood firm. But the foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand, and the rains came tumbling down. The rains came down, and the floods came up. The rains came down, and the floods came up. The rains came down, and the floods came up, and the house on the sand fell flat. <coughs> oh, all right. Well, that's what I'm going to get you to see today, and I don't want you to bump that box for me, but I want you to come around so that you can see it. And I'm going to take the lid off this box. Hey, are you ready to come look in the box? Come look in this box. Okay, but let's not touch it because it has sand in it right now. And I need to get out of the way so that you can see when I take this lid off. Now, don't touch it because it's fragile. It's got sand. Can you see what's in there? There's sand, there's a rock, and what else is there? Houses. And we're going to find out what happens because here comes the rain. Watch. The rain comes. Huh. The rains come. Oh no. What's happening to the houses on the sand? What? Oh, the houses on the sand? Uh-oh, they're sinking, they're rolling down the hill. But look, those houses on the rock, they stand firm. Oh, there it goes, down the hill. Which house would you rather live in? Yeah, I think we want to live on the, in the houses on the rock. And I want to tell you something. Those houses on the rock, the reason they stayed there, I glued them to that rock. <laughs> but guess what? I also glued those houses to the sand. Okay. It's the same glue on all of them. We need to be glued to the rock. We don't want to be glued to the sand. Because if we're glued to the sand, it just doesn't work, yeah. does it? Yeah, it went right down that hill. Oh, all right. Hey, well, thank you for coming up this morning. And did you see that on the screen as it went down the hill? Sure enough, that looks good. Well, thank you for coming. I'll put a lid back on this for now. And I want you to always remember, that's what happens when we're on the rock. Glued to the rock, we stand firm. But on the sand, it's not going to work out so good. All right. Thank you. All right. You want to help down the stairs? No. No? You're going to do it here yourself? I like that. <laughs> Bye. -bye. All right, and a special thanks to Nate who got that camera set up over there for us so that we could see what was going on in there. Let's pray one more time. Lord Jesus, come into our hearts. And I pray that in our hearts we fall in love with you and we stand firm upon you, Lord Jesus, the rock of our salvation. Open our hearts today. We want to see you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Do you have a favorite Bible character? 
maybe several, if you're like me. But if you had to narrow it down to, well, let's not narrow it down yet. Who are some favorite Bible characters? Shout them out. Jonah, Job, the three Hebrew fellows, Jacob, good ones, good ones. What were those three Hebrews' names? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Do you know their other names, their original ones? Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Did I get that right? Yep. All right. And Daniel, he wrote the book. He also had a Babylonian name, but we always remember him by, by Daniel. <laughs> anyway, but who is, if you had to pick one, number one, most favorite, who's your favorite Bible character? Yep, I knew I was going to hear that one. Jesus is our number one most favorite Bible character. Uh, Jesus is my hero. I remember when I was in academy. Then um, back in those days, us guys wanted to have hair, long hair. And uh, the school rules said that we couldn't have hair over our ears. So we would push the limits. We would make our hair to where it could get behind our ear, but when teachers weren't around or whatever, it could come out over our ears a little bit. We were, we were, we were pushing the limits. One day, the Bible teacher said to us, we weren't in class, we were out on campus, and he said, why do you guys want long hair anyway? And I piped right up, because my hero had long hair. And he said, well, you shouldn't have those rock stars as heroes. Lift your sights higher. And I said, rock stars? I was talking about Jesus. <laughs> okay, I was having fun with my Bible teacher. But uh, Jesus is our hero, I hope, for every one of us. What about a Bible book? Do you have a favorite Bible book? Let's start off Old Testament. Do you have a favorite Old Testament Bible book? Anyone have a favorite Old Testament Bible book? Psalm, Psalm? what? Psalms? Genesis, Proverbs. Proverbs, some good ones. You know, a lot of people say Psalms as a favorite one. A lot of people know the Psalms, even if they don't know the Bible very well, they, they, they know some of the promises and poetry of the Psalms. And uh, I appreciate a number of the Psalms. Within the Psalms, what is there, 150 different ones? And so you can have favorites within the Psalms as well. Um, Another book that I didn't hear anyone say on my list of favorites is Jonah. I like the book of Jonah. The message, several good messages, is, but one of the big ones that's in there is God loves all people, every nation, every culture. And even the ones that are not acting so good, he loves them and wants to do what he can to redeem them and restore them into a unity with him all people. I love that. No one said the book of Daniel. You like the book of Daniel? Okay, good. A lot of nods. Where would we be without the book of Daniel when it comes to prophecy? Daniel is kind of the foundation of, of prophecy and understanding and, and how it builds from their time prophecies, the prophecies of, of the nations, the prophecies of Jesus himself and his birth. I love the book of Daniel. But Proverbs, I heard that one. Proverbs is one of my favorite in the Old Testament. I fell in love with Proverbs early on. A list of all of these wise sayings, insight, wisdom, guidance. But is it my favorite? I guess it depends on what day you ask me. <laughs> what about the New Testament? Do you have a favorite in the New Testament? Okay, I'm seeing some nods. What's a favorite? Revelation. Revelation. Anything different? Matthew. Matthew. John. I, uh, I love the Gospels. The Gospels, the heart of Jesus and, and his life, his ministry, what he did and how he revealed the love of God and how he taught about his kingdom. Uh, Matthew, Matthew particularly, was so focused and dedicated to details. I mean, which other one of the uh, writers of the Gospels has the entire Sermon of Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount, where that story came from, 
uh, of the wise man who built his house upon the rock. Uh, detailed. I love that. And, um, and, and Mark, understand Mark was perhaps the first of the New Testament Gospels written. And then Luke, the only one written by someone who wasn't Jewish. And he was a doctor. And then uh, John. John, the disciple that Jesus kept loving. Fantastic, uh, wonderful book. He kind of picks up where the other disciples, where the other gospel writers left off, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And John picks up and he adds more details, particularly details of the end of Jesus's life. By the time you get to chapter 13, you're already at the Last Supper. And, and there's half the book left to go. And uh, a fantastic book. Well, what about the letters of Paul? Are they favorites? Oh, what would we do without Paul and how he built upon the gospel and brought it home to how it touches our life today and the understanding of, of God and the plan of salvation and how it all works, tying in the Old Testament and Jesus and the fulfillment of those prophecies. I love the writings of Paul. But maybe, maybe, just maybe, the letter that James wrote is my favorite. It caught my attention early, early on. And uh, I like the way James brings balance to what Paul has to say when it comes to righteousness by faith. Um, in my study of the book of James, then I, I discovered some other reasons why maybe it's been my favorite along the way. What I want us to uh, do today, and I'm beginning a series focusing on the book of James, I want us to look at the importance of James and where he got his information and, and the message that he's speaking to us. Sometimes the letter written by James has been referred to as the Proverbs of the New Testament. Have you ever heard that? I hadn't thought of it in that light. James, the Proverbs of the New Testament. But then I thought, well, maybe that's why I've liked James from early on, because I liked Proverbs. And then James comes along and he brings it in within the gospel light after the birth of Jesus, maybe. And he focuses on the words of Jesus and what Jesus taught. Maybe, maybe that's why I like the book of James. In his opening, James declares, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. What I want you to see today is the words of James, in these words of James, is that the wisdom that James gives us comes directly from the words and the life of Jesus. James is sharing wisdom and it comes directly from the words and life of Jesus. It was Jesus who said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened to you. So James says, if any of you likes wisdom, ask of God and he'll give it. And he had heard from Jesus, ask. Seek, knock, you'll get it. Anthony, Anthony Silvagio, who chances are you've never heard of, wrote an article, a really good article that, uh, that appeared in Reformation 21, an online um, magazine, Christian uh, journal. And the article is called Hearing the Voice of Jesus in the Epistle of James. In this article, he said, and I agree with him, he said, no other New Testament epistle captures the preaching voice of Jesus like the epistle of James. No one else, no other book captures the preaching voice of Jesus so much as, as James did. However, there are those who have had very different opinions and didn't care much for the book of James. Amazingly, Martin Luther was one of them. Martin Luther said the book of James doesn't even deserve to be in the Bible. He says it's an epistle of straw. There's nothing there. He said that it contained nothing of the nature of the gospel. And he didn't like the book of James. 
uh, another fellow uh, who used to be the uh, uh, a leading British New Testament scholar, James Dunn, passed away a few years ago. This is what he wrote. He said, James is the most Jewish, the most indistinctively Christian document in the New Testament. The most indistinctively Christian. In other words, what's there that has anything to do with Christianity? But I want us to take a look, a closer look, because I believe it's there and giving the balance, as I've already said, to the other writings that have already appeared. The Apostle Paul did a wonderful thing to teach us about righteousness by faith, about the grace of God, our only hope of salvation. He wrote, not of works, lest any man should boast. You've heard that, you know that verse. And though James addresses faith from a different emphasis, I've never seen him and Paul disagree. Together they present a balanced message of what salvation is. Today, as we jump into the book of James, the first thing I need to ask is, who was James? Well, the letter, the epistle of James, doesn't really specifically, positively identify who it was. And there are several options. But the most likely and what most everyone agrees on is that James is the James whose name first appears in Matthew 13. In Matthew 13, it's the story of Jesus having returned to Nazareth. And while there, the people are rather puzzled and amazed that this kid who grew up in their town, and it was a little town and everybody knew everybody, has got a bunch of people following him and calling him master and calling him rabbi. And they knew that he had wonderful insights to the Bible, but as he began to speak with even greater power and authority that they had heard, Matthew 13, verse 55, they asked this question, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is this not his mother called Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? We know this guy. And did you see the name James in there? Who was James? Jesus' brother, one of his brothers. It's the same James that in Acts 15 is the James that obviously has been chosen by the early church to be the voice for the church and an administrator of the church. He might not have been the uh, one that was the greatest evangelist out there, but he had skills in, in organize, organization and bringing together peace and understanding and communication. So James, the same Jesus, the brother of Jesus, became a leader in the early church. Is this James who authored the letter, and I believe it is. No wonder he's so familiar with the teachings of Jesus. He knew Jesus his whole life. He grew up with Jesus. And what a privilege, what an experience. Though the Bible does give indication that the brothers and sisters, he had sisters as well, didn't always appreciate Jesus. This little guy who never did anything wrong. <laughs> this little guy who uh, might have uh, given them a little bit of wisdom. Hey, don't do that. Don't do that. My, uh, I, I have two children, a son and a daughter. And, and the two of them were very, very, very different. Jeremy was the one that uh, was bouncing off the walls and off the furniture at a young age. The one that uh, ended up breaking his leg. <laughs> his sister was a little calmer and a little more thoughtful as she watched her brother and decided what to do and what not to do. <laughs> and uh, so here we have a family with, we've listed the names of four brothers. He had sisters as well, the Bible says, which is plural, at least two. And little Jesus growing up with them. But the time came when, uh, when James realized who Jesus was, had a conversion experience. I have an assignment I want you to do. Um, it's an assignment that 
I really appreciated when I've done, and I do from time to time, just to look at it and see it again. Here's the assignment. Do you have a Bible that's a red letter edition? If it's in red letters, it's the words of Jesus. The assignment is start with the book of Matthew and just look at Matthew and read nothing but the red letters. Okay, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, there's going to be a lot of it right there. But then you can go through and you can read. And this might take you, uh, you know, more than this afternoon. But read just the red letters and then go and try and do it this week. Read through the book of James so that you're up on the things we're going to be talking about and see how many times James is quoting or referring to something that Jesus said. Just read the red letters in Matthew and then read just the five short chapters of James and see what we're going to be looking at for the next few weeks. Then you might want to go back and and do the same thing and look at the red words in Mark and in Luke and in John and see what's there uh, after you've read James. Wait, that one's there too. There it is. You'll be convinced that James had an excellent knowledge of what Jesus said, what Jesus taught. The first time I read the book of James, I was a teenager. And I want to show you the very first thing that I remember as impressing me in the book of James. It wasn't in chapter 1 or chapter 2, it was in chapter 3. And verses 2 through 11, I want us to look at that. James 3, verse 2, For if we stumble in many things, if anyone does not stumble in word, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Now that caught my attention. Jesus had said, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. And I knew that. I was inspired by this. I wanted to be perfect, and now James had told me where to start if I wanted to start. He said, start with your words. I had a beginning. It was a challenge. James went on making his point, and it all made sense to me. He explained it. Verse 3, Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn their whole bodies. I had seen that. I had seen that. My, both my grandparents had horses. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they're turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles? And the tongue is a fire a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. For if every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue, it's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Now as a teenager, I didn't really notice that part about no man can tame the tongue. And so I'm kind of glad that I didn't because I decided that's something that I should be doing. And I think that it's something that we all need to do. But I want to tell you the story. James had challenged me. I had accepted the challenge. Perfection was my goal. Now that word perfect worries a number of people. They think, okay, we're going to be starting talking about legalism, working your way to heaven. You got to be good enough. Well, relax. A couple of Bible verses for us to look at within the context of perfection. In Philippians 2.13 we read, It is God who works in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. Who works in you? God works in you. And as Paul began this letter to the Philippians, referring to God, he wrote in chapter 1 verse 6, He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. He started the work. He'll keep on going as long as you let him. I've concluded that there's several reasons why it's God who perfects us instead of telling us to perfect ourselves. One of them is, I don't think we would know perfection if we saw it. We think we know. There's different ideas of perfection, and I've heard a lot of arguments about perfection and its importance, and I think in some of those arguments they probably made angels cry. 
as they look at us and say, if only you knew what you were talking about. You want to know perfection? I only know one place to point you to. Get to know Jesus. Look at Jesus. Watch Jesus. Learn of Jesus. And let God work upon you to make you like Him. However, if God is to be successful with His desired outcome, which is our perfection, we must be willing. We must be purposefully involved in the work that God is giving us to do. That God is doing Himself, rather, and He gives us parts to do. So back to that initial reaction to the challenge. I knew there were some things that I needed to change. You see, I was a young teenager. I might have even been 12 or 13 at this time. And I had been expanding my vocabulary. And I practiced my vocabulary on my twin sisters, two years younger than me, and I warned them, if you ever tell mom and dad what the words I'm saying, it's going to get even worse when they're not here. And I don't know if I scared them or not, but they never told. And so I expanded my vocabulary with some of the words that I was hearing at the public school where I went. And, uh, and I got bolder and braver with that and with some of my friends. And I knew that those were the kind of words that I needed to stop saying if I took James' challenge. If you want to be perfect, control the tongue. So I made up my mind. No more bad words. No more off-colored jokes. That was out. And I prayed about it. I told God that I wanted to be perfect. I asked for His forgiveness and I promised you'll never hear another one of those words from my mouth. Well, he didn't hear many. <laughs> and any time one of them slipped out, then it stabbed me and I prayed about it and I, I, I asked for forgiveness all over again. And I said, I'll keep trying, I'll keep trying. And I want to tell you, I'm thankful. I am thankful that I was able to bring those words under control, but there was something that bothered me. It was a couple of years before I realized this. I realized I needed to control both ends of my tongue. The end that said the words and the ends where the words started. And I couldn't control but the end where I could close my mouth, those words were still there. If I hit my hand with a hammer, they didn't come out, but they bounced around in my brain like the silver ball on a shiny pinball machine. Boop, 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 boop. They didn't come out, but they were still there, and I realized I was never going to be perfect because I couldn't get to the root of the tongue, and I knew I had to get to the root of, to of the tongue. And so I went to God, and I confessed, and I said, I'm sorry, I can't do it. I failed. There's nothing I can do about it. They're still there. If those words are going to be gone, you're going to have to take them away. I can't do it. I still remember when I realized that that prayer had been answered. I was in my college dorm room, and uh, why is it our feet, when we're barefooted, find something for us to stub our toes on? I don't know. We've all done it. Oh, it hurts so bad. I caught my little toe on my left foot on my desk, on the leg of my desk, and oh, it hurt, and I'm jumping up and down, and nothing's coming out except, oh, 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 I'm jumping up and down, holding on one foot because I'm holding my toe on the other. I can't do that anymore. <laughs> if I tried to show you, I'd fall over. But suddenly I realized, suddenly I realized there were no words bouncing around. It was just, oh, 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 oh. And in that second or so, I paused, and then I started jumping up and down. And my roommate, who had stopped to watch the show, was rather amazed. Because instead of just going, oh, 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 I was going, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> And he gets a funny look on his face. I had to explain the whole story to him. He thought it was a good story. And it is. God had taken the words away. They weren't bouncing around in there. So when I had opportunity all by myself, I went on my knees and I prayed and I said, Thank you, Jesus. 
Thank you for doing what I couldn't do. Thank you for changing me. And I still remember what he said to me. I heard it clearly in my mind. I knew it wasn't out loud, but this is what I heard. I'm glad to have taken them away from you. I'll keep them. If you ever want them back, they're yours. Just start using them and I'll give them all back. Whoa. <laughs> now that's a lesson that stuck with me a long time. When God gives you a victory, live in the victory because you can always go back and get back what he already took from you that you didn't want in the first place. I am so thankful he still has those words. I don't want them. He can keep them and he can throw them to the depths of the sea. I want to show you something else. Look at what James tells us in chapter 5 verse 12. But above all, but above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. So before ending his chapter, his letter, he came back to this very important thing about controlling the tongue and he expands it just a little bit more. He says a simple yes will do. <clears throat> you don't need to dress it up with any more words. Just yes. A simple no will do. You don't need to add explicit, ex, ex, expletives. Just a simple yes, a simple no. And you don't need to swear on the Bible. You don't need to swear on the life of your firstborn child. You don't need to swear on heaven itself. None of that's going to make a positive contribution. Just keep it simple from an honest and pure heart. A simple yes will do. A simple no. Where do you think James got this idea? Well, you're right. You didn't say it, but you were thinking it because I've already told you. This is about James telling us what Jesus had said. So listen to what Jesus said one day as he taught the people in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 33 through 37. Jesus said, again, you've heard it said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, and your no, no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. James got it right from his little brother, and he put it there for us in his letter. One day, one day Matthew tells us in Matthew 15, when Jesus had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, hear and understand. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles the man. So be careful what comes out. Our words influence others, but believe me, I know from experience, our words influence others. Us. My words influence me. Be careful with your words. The Bible indicates, as I already mentioned, that James wasn't always a fan of Jesus, but I'm glad that he became one. I'm glad James, big brother, shared with us in his letter what impressed upon him and what he wanted to share on. I'm not perfect yet. God hadn't finished with me. I'm thankful for what he's done for me. You're thankful for what he's done for you. But we're still in this. He's still working on us. He's not done with us yet. But I know that as long as I honestly listen to and put forth my effort to do what God says, it'll happen. God will perfect me. Because that's what God is doing. Even the desire to change comes from God. Did you know that? Even the desire to change comes from God. Jesus ended his message that day, the Sermon on the Mount, with a story that we just saw uh, that was demonstrated in my little sandbox. He said, the wise man built his house upon the rock. Jesus is the rock. And the words of Jesus are the rock. 
And the amazing thing about the rock is that when we're attached to the rock, we stand firm. But did you know something about sand? Sand is also rock. Sand, you look at it under a microscope. In fact, I've seen pictures of sand under the, uh, I forget what they call, the most powerful microscopes we got out there. And it looks like boulders. It's a rock. What it is, is it's little pieces of the rock that have been shipped off. It's easier to build a house on sand than it is on rock. Because on sand, you can shift that around and make it fit just what you want. But if you're going to build on rock, sometimes you've got to make your foundation fit the rock that's already there. In, uh, in Gladstone, the church that I pastored in Oregon for a dozen years, then we had a building project. Uh, where we built a fellowship hall uh, on and then uh, the lower area it was on a hillside was uh, three more rooms for the school which was right next door and they were growing and they needed it. Gladstone. Does the name give you any suggestion of what the ground is? Well that's not where it got its name but it should give you anyway. That ground is rock. That ground is so much rock as they were working on it they had to you know, bring in this drill thing and break, break rocks off. And uh, we were hauling rock off and moving it. I built a rock wall by my garden because my hill went down the side. Uh, that's a lot of work. But we had to, as we worked, shape and build the foundation to the rock that was there. Yes, we could shape the rock and take some of it away. But the builders, as they were building the foundation, designed it and w connected the foundation right into the rock that was there. That's what we have to do. There are those who build upon the sand when it comes to the Word of God. And what that is, is picking and choosing what we want to follow and making it fit our ideas and our thoughts. Oh, this is not that important. I don't need to worry about that. And we come up with our own ideas. That's building upon the sand. To build upon the rock lets the rock change us. And that's what it's all about. From James and Jesus, I learned that I must be careful to choose wisely the words that I speak. And from James and Jesus, I learn that I need to let the words of Jesus have their impact upon me. And that's the beginning as we look at the book of James. Hope you'll do your homework assignment. What is it? Read the red. And then read the book of James and see what it has to say. We're going to sing together a closing song, Thy Word. And uh, let's sing this as a prayer and as a commitment as we build upon the rock, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the words of wisdom that he shared with us.